as the AUKUS alliance backfired. Canberra warns Beijing of a red line after China signs a security pact with the Solomon Islands. Beijing says it has no plans to build a military base, but should Australia be worried? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the AUKUS Alliance. When Australia, the UK and the US came together to form the AUKUS alliance in September, they never explicitly mentioned Beijing, though it was pretty clear a main objective of the pact was to counter Chinese influence in the Indo-Pacific. But seven months later, there's huge concern after China and the Solomon Islands did this. The Solomon Islands Foreign Minister, the Honorable uh, Jeremiah Manelli, has signed the Security Cooperation Framework with his People's Republic of China counterpart, State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang, Wang He, a few days ago. The details of that framework haven't been made public, but the AUKUS nations are wary. They suspect the agreement could allow China to build a military base less than 2,000 kilometers from Australian shores. For Canberra, that's a red line. After the deal was signed, Australia's foreign minister, Maurice Payne, said her government was deeply disappointed. Uh, we understand, though, that this is a uh, very serious decision that the Solomon Islands has made. Uh, we are, as we've said today, deeply disappointed that they have chosen to go down this path. But ultimately, it is a sovereign decision for the Solomon Islands. So how did we get to this point? Well, in 2019, the Solomon Islands established diplomatic ties with China after cutting ties with Taiwan. It was a divisive decision. Some within Prime Minister Manasseh Sogabare's cabinet, who didn't back the move, were sacked. And last year, violent protests erupted, targeting parliament and Chinese businesses. So what does this new security pact say about the extent of the relationship between Beijing and Honiara? Well, China says the deal has no military element whatsoever and urged all parties concerned not to jump to conclusions. As two independent and sovereign countries, China and the Solomon Islands can carry out normal law enforcement and security cooperation on the basis of equal treatment and mutual benefit. This is in line with international law and practice, as well as conducive to maintaining social order in the Solomon Islands, promoting regional peace and stability, and enhancing the common interests of China and the Solomon Islands as well as countries in the region. We hope that the parties concerned can look at it objectively and calmly and not over-interpret it. Despite Australia's concern, the Solomon Islands is standing by the deal. Prime Minister Manasseh Sogabare criticized Canberra for keeping his nation out of the loop when it formed the AUKUS alliance. He was dismayed to say he only learned about it through the media. But he also said his country's deal with China would not affect regional peace. I ask all our neighbors, friends, and partners to respect the sovereign interests of Solomon Islands on the assurance that the decision will not adversely impact or undermine the peace and harmony of our region. Let me assure the people of Solomon Islands that we entered into an arrangement with China with our eyes wide open, guided by our national interests. We have full understanding of the fragility of peace and our duty as a state is to protect all people, their properties and critical national infrastructures of the country. So has the AUKUS alliance provoked a potentially greater security crisis in the Indo-Pacific? Joining me now to debate that from Brisbane is John Blacksland, a professor of international security and intelligence studies at the Australian National University. From Beijing, Victor Gao, Suzhou University's chair professor. And from Washington, Patricia O'Brien, a historian and professor in the Asian studies program at Georgetown University. Thanks all so much for being with us. 
AUKUS is, of course, the UK, the US, and Australia, but the Indo-Pacific is Australia's backyard. Uh, Chinese and Solomon Islands authorities are saying, don't exaggerate, don't jump to conclusions. Our security pact is just about us. But John Blacksland, would Australia be foolish not to worry? No, thanks, Andrea. Good to be with you. Yes, uh, look, you know, the problem is that China has a clear interests in expanding its presence in the Pacific. They're compelling economic and strategic reasons to push back against Australia's close alignment with the United States. Uh, Australia has really surprised, I think, China at how strongly over the last few years it's pushed back. It pushed back on the 14 demands, the demands that Australia, including a domestic, domestic uh, policy issues, comply with Chinese direction. Um, and uh, we've seen here, this is, I think, a manifestation of Chinese attempts to influence Australia's neighbourhood in a way that is definitely about a bit of a quid pro quo for Australia being so closely aligned with the United States and so vocal in its criticism of China uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, did Australia have to do what it did? Did it have to be that vocal? I mean, some would say provocative toward China? So, you know, there's, uh, I think there's uh, around the margins, there's some room for, um, you know, manoeuvre about the rhetoric. Substantively, though, it's very hard for any Australian government to simply bow down and accept the, the kind of 14 points uh, demands and the expectation that Australia should just follow China's lead, uh, the lead of an authoritarian state that's basically been trying to ply Australia away from its alliance with the United States. Um, and that's, that's something that's got uh, support from across both sides of the aisle in Parliament, in the Australian uh, Parliament. So it, it's understandable that we should push back, I think. And what we, it's only fair to note also, Andrea, that the authoritarianism of China has been much more brazen in recent times. Going back uh, since President Xi became president uh, in 2012 onwards, we've seen a much more assertive China, a much more uh, difficult and contentious relationship emerge, not just with Australia, but with Korea, with Japan, with Canada, with Sweden, with the United States. We just happen to be the closest US ally in the Pacific, other than Japan, that's particularly outspoken. Now, we've got, you know, Australia is a, what I call a WYSIWYG country. It's a, what you see is what you get. Some of us aren't terribly subtle, um, and our, our, our politicians like to speak loudly and carry maybe a slightly smaller stick than they should. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, this is a very sobering moment for Australia to reflect on. Okay, Victor Gao, I mean, should Beijing be believed when it says uh, Australia shouldn't blow this out of proportion, that they have no intention of building a military base in the Solomon Islands, that this is just a basic security pact between two sovereign countries who have some common interests? Indeed, I think Australia should acknowledge upfront that both China and the Solomon Islands are sovereign countries, and they have full discretion to decide what kind of agreement they want to sign between these two sovereign countries. And Australia should also acknowledge in the public that Solomon Islands does not have an overlord. If Australia believes Australia is the overlord of Solomon Islands, then come on, wake up. And further, Solomon Islands has a very large Chinese diaspora. And in the last round of uh, domestic uh, instability, for example, uh, there was a lot of damage to the Chinese interests in Solomon Islands. And this is one driving reason why the Solomon Islands and China wanted to sign this security uh, agreement between themselves to better protect the different communities in the Solomon Islands. And also don't forget, Solomon Islands is not within Australia. It's about 2,000 kilometers away from uh, Australia. And you mentioned about South, uh, South Pacific. South Pacific is not the backyard of any country. South Pacific, together with the Pacific, is open to all international cooperation. China is a major force for international cooperation. Wake up if you do not realize that this is the mega trend of our time. Okay, uh, let me get to Patricia then quickly. I mean, uh, 
yeah, it's 2,000 kilometers away. It's nobody's backyard. Australia is in no position to, to see this as, as a threat anyway. And if the security pact, though, this is what I really have to ask, if it has no military element, as China says, what's it really for? And, and why have the details not been disclosed? Well, I uh, am not in a position to say why the details haven't been disclosed, but we do know from our uh, Solomon Islands minister last week that the uh, final uh, signed document is close to the draft. And that does give China considerable uh, opportunities to uh, to um, get into the Solomon Islands in ways that uh, people find concerning, particularly that Chinese military personnel will not be subject to Solomon Islands law and that they can be called in to, uh, for, for issues of civil unrest. And that's the kind of element that I find particularly disturbing um, and, uh, and, and concerning and what also concerns people in the Solomon Islands too because, there's, because of the unrest that there's a lot of uh, avenues that and latitude that the that the agreement gives that that really are not going to help uh, civil order in the Solomon Islands and actually it it, it is a, a you know a potential scenario where there's going to be some very uh, serious uh, issues uh, for Solomon Islanders who disagree with the current prime minister. And that's what I find uh, most concerning is the erosion of democracy and the erosion of public safety uh, mm. that, that the agreement, um, we're talking about the security deal between China and the Solomon Islands, uh, that, that, that that's uh, what I'm most, most concerned about. Right, okay, so John, I saw you chuckle at a lot of what Victor had to say and then Nodger had an agreement with, with Patricia there. Um, we have to remember, though, at the same time, I mean, there are these pacts, Solomon China uh, and Solomon Australia. Ooh. They're meant to coexist, according to the authorities in the Solomon Islands. You've said before it's not popular, but is it possible for these agreements to coexist? So, look, it may be possible to coexist, but one of them is completely opaque and one of them is uh, really... Uh, not, you know, it's not being, we're not being straight with each other about this, what's going on here. Australia has been the principal beneficiary for the Solomon Islands in terms of uh, aid and in terms of security guarantees. For 20 years, Australia has been sending troops, uh, police and military to assist the people of the Solomon Islands. And in November last year, when what Victor Gow talked about, Chinese interests being challenged inside Solomon Islands, who came to the rescue? Australia. We're the ones who provided the support. We are the ones who have, for two, more than two decades now, been actively and intimately involved in providing support to the people of Solomon Islands. What we're seeing here is effectively uh, the Prime Minister of, of Solomon Islands, uh, Manasseh Sogavari, having been effectively, it would appear, being bought off by China, because there's no other plausible explanation for for the Solomon Islands, who has been the greatest beneficiary of Australian generosity, to refuse our advice, to refuse our counsel, and to turn to China, a country whose language they don't speak. Let's not forget, the Solomon Islands is a country, former British colony, so they're a common law country, they speak English. The elites at Solomon Islands send their kids to Brisbane, Melbourne or Sydney for schooling. They don't send them to Beijing. They don't speak Mandarin. What is it in this? And when you look at, if you look around the Solomon Islands, you look at the provincial governors and you look at the people of Malaita who are the most uh, upset about what's going on here, they are strongly opposed to what's going on. So what Manasseh Sogavari has done, he, he has fomented unrest inside the Solomon Islands for his own political purposes and he's enlisted the support of China uh, to, to pursue what is in China's interests and in Manasseh Sogavari's interests, but I would contend quite strongly not in the interests of the people of the Solomon Islands. To have Australia 
be rejected in this way is a slap in the face that I think is completely unwarranted. Australia has been so generous to the Solomon Islands. This is, un is extraordinary. But, I mean, all kudos to China. Very, very clever the way they pulled this off. Uh, but to say that, you know, this is the country, China is the country that says, we are big, you are small. To talk about us being two sovereign states, that's not the approach they take in the South China Sea. It's not the approach they take to ASEAN states that they pick up one at a time. It's not the approach they've taken to relations with the Philippines over the arbitral tribunal ruling of 2016, where they simply ignored it. Okay. So this is a complete set of standards. Victor, I'll let you reply. And I'd also like you to address uh, one of John's first comments there about this not being the choice, really, of a sovereign nation necessarily within the Solomon Islands. It's more about politicians uh, being paid off. What does China say to that? First of all, I think if John is serious about this, come up with all the evidence. You cannot just make false accusations against two sovereign nations, China on the one hand and sovereign, uh, Solomon Islands on the other hand. Such false, false accusation will have legal consequences. Secondly, what John says is really a very stereotype of uh, colonialism. The fact that you say that Solomon Islands was part of the Commonwealth, speaks English, etc., therefore they should follow the leadership, if any, of Australia? Yeah. No. Time is changing. South Pacific is changing. The Pacific is changing. And there is no denying that China is the largest trading nation of many South Pacific nations. And China is the most important economic player with Australia. And China has the largest amount of sovereign debt in the United States. All these are real facts. And I hope, John, you will wake up and acknowledge that this is the realities you are faced with. And when Solomon Islands, which is a sovereign country, and China, another sovereign country, after reaching an agreement to cooperate closely to partially protect the Chinese communities, if there is any disturbance in the Solomon Islands. And this is because in the last round of the disturbance, the Australian forces, I was told, refused to help the Chinese communities in the Solomon Islands. Oh, this was the driving ridiculous. force of this security compact between China and the Solomon Islands. So we need to adjust ourselves to the changing times, including in the South Pacific. Okay, uh, John, I can see you disagree, but so does Patricia. I want to give everybody equal time. Pa uh, Patricia, then let me, let me come to you. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so a couple of things. Um, Professor Gao talked about evidence. I think he needs to provide evidence that uh, the United that Australia didn't support the Chinese community uh, in the in the uh, riots in November. I don't think there is any evidence. I think it's an accusation without foundation. Also, I would like to point out. This us and them between Australia and China, we really need to remember that there are many people in Australia of Chinese descent. They are an important integral part of our country. So this us and them between Australia and China, I think it's a, it's a, it's a false consciousness and I think it needs to stop because there, Australia and China are an integrated community. There are so many people in Australia who have uh, family, deep ties. Uh, Fair enough. But uh, Patricia, I mean, I, I have to go back a bit to what both uh, John and Victor were talking about in the history uh, of the relationship between Australia and the Solomon Islands. I, I wouldn't say, in, in some cases, it's not exactly the warmest, fuzziest history between two nations. I mean, Australia was accused of using Solomon Islands slave labor, actually, uh, to bring over for sugar plantations. That still resonates with people on the Solomon Islands. And you've said yourself, Australia needs to take bold steps uh, to reinforce relationships uh, yes, with Pacific does. Island ours. So, so yeah, is, is Australia, what does it need to address? Not just historically, but, you know, going forward and building a better bond with some of uh, its partners in the Pacific Islands. Yes, okay, so one of the things that I, I've criticised uh, and, and the history that Australia has with the Solomon Islands, as you said, is long and complicated and there's parts of that history 
that uh, Australia should not be proud of. The, uh, the way that Australia has treated uh, Pacific Islanders uh, that live in the arc around the northeast of Australia is something that Australia really has to reckon with, and I don't think that they prop properly have yet. Now, one thing that Australia has prevented uh, Pacific Islanders from doing is enjoying living in Australia like so many Chinese people do. What I think Australia needs to do, and the uh, Labor Party recently has announced that it's going to increase the number of Pacific Islander people who can come and live in Australia as permanent residents. Now, this is a fundamental part of improving okay. the bonds okay. between the Solomon Islands and, uh, Aust and Australia and also allowing Solomon Islanders economic opportunities that they currently don't have and opportunities for education for their children. And it is a fundamental, uh, a, a, it's a fundamental thing that Australia must address. And uh, okay. Australia, to this point, has... So if they've, they've tried to fix things in the Solomon Islands in the islands without allowing a lot of Solomon Islanders into Australia. Right. And I think that that's the thing that, that uh, Australia needs to do. And it's not colonial, it's anti-colonial. So now, I I mean, that... now we are where we are, though, and this is we just have our few minutes left. Uh, and, you know, we have to go back to, to what we're talking about today, being the potential backfiring of the AUKUS alliance. And we talked about, yeah. John was especially saying, you know, the, criticizing this, this Chinese Solomon Islands deal as not being transparent. They won't release the details of it. But there's the same argument on the other side that AUKUS snuck up on everybody. Uh, the Solomon Islands was not made aware. And then they have the gall to say, oh, it's not about Beijing. This agreement is not about China. Um, and people are laughing at that. And now we have the security alliance between Solomon Islands and, Aust uh, and China saying, oh, no, we have no intention. John, I'll come back to you. Uh, there's no intention and there's no military element here. Um, but still, we have Australia feeling it has the right to declare China, any Chinese military base as a red line. Uh, we had a Chinese colonel actually say that's laughable if, if Australia thinks it's in a position to say that. But, John, do you think Australia should declare red lines in this case? Yeah, look, I don't think the idea of a red line has been at all helpful. Um, it, it's really, in fact, a little bit counterproductive. Uh, but let's let's be clear, you know, this is... Uh, Australia has been the major benefactor of the Solomon Islands. Uh, this pact has come up... It's, to compare it with AUKUS is really, I think, very unhelpful. Let's not forget, Australia already is an alliance partner with the United States, and it has security arrangements with the United Kingdom that go back over a century. So the idea that AUKUS is somehow a dramatic transformation is, I think, you know, it's more political spin than anything. Um, we don't have, uh, the, the, you know, much to show for what AUKUS was about initially, really. Uh, it potentially might happen in a decade or so, but we're seeing Australia and the United Kingdom and the United States in close alignment on a number of issues. And look, what's really interesting, uh, Andrea, is that behind the scenes, a lot of people in Southeast Asia and the Pacific are quietly pretty, uh, they're quite OK with Australia being more closely aligned with the United States and with the United Kingdom playing a role. Why? Because most countries in the neighbourhood are deeply worried about the need to counterbalance China. China's authoritative, authoritarian sorry, behaviour, its assertiveness in the South China Sea, its, its reinventing of the rules about the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, its claiming to Obama's face that they're not going to militarise these constructed islands in the South China Sea, only to turn around and then militarise them. This is generating enormous concern about us not being able to take China at its word. Okay. Now, when you think about... I, I just, we have a one minute left, and I do need to let Victor yeah. get a response into what, to what has been said. Go ahead, Victor. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, John, uh, no matter how much benefit Australia has provided uh, Solomon Islands, it doesn't reduce the sovereignty of the Solomon Islands. So treat with Solomon Islands with full respect and fully respect oh. its sovereignty. Secondly, AUKUS is in violation of the Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty. It's in violation of the South Pacific uh, Nuclear Free Zone. It will really bring in greater tension, not only in that part of the world, but in the Asian Pacific region as a whole. 
Another point. No. We know for sure. Everyone in China in the decision-making <laughs> circle knows <laughs> Australia is blood treaty with the United States. So if there was, a, if there will be any conflict, Australia will fight together with the United States with whatever enemy of the United States. We know this for sure. But this does not give <laughs> Australia more reason to be a warmonger. You need to be a force for good between China and the United States. You can be a good go-between or mediator between China and the United States. You really do not want to rush to the front as a foot soldier of the United States, stirring up a more confrontation okay. rather than or diplomacy. Victor, Victor John, I'm not sure you have a, a response there, but I'm going to have to give Victor the final word because we are actually over time. Uh, for this edition of, of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much for being with us, uh, our viewers, of course, as well. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey, and we'll see you next time.